is kind of like Halloween when you're Tom McGowan, who is now being the wizard in Wicked on Broadway. Tom, welcome to you, At Nelson. Nelson's. Thank you very much. The wonderful yeah. Wizard of Oz. Oh, I thought you were saying the wonderful <laughs> Nelson. Uh, yeah, well, two wonderful guys exactly. sitting around together. Exactly. Uh, and you used to live on this very block, so you were coming home. I used to live right across the street. It is, it is kind of full circle, yeah. I, if you still lived there, I could look into your window and I could see what was going on. That's right. And you could say if you I was late, you could tell me to get a move on. You've never been late a day in your That's life. That's right. You can't do that when you're doing a live show. You can't, no. But now, I, I, I recall when I saw The Wizard, uh, the Wicked, that The Wizard doesn't make his entrance until later in the show. So what do you do for all that time? Well, I can't like watch TV or read novels or anything that's going to be too engrossing. So I usually, I have magazines, I have crossword puzzles, I have little things like that. And I'll go around and visit people who are working very hard, <laughs> singing and dancing during their, you know, when they're off stage time. But I do have about an hour and 15 minutes before my first entrance. And, um, you know, that's, uh, it's good to be the wizard. <laughs> do, do you have like a special throne? Do you have any special dressing room perks? What's it like back then? No, uh, no, no perks. In fact, they just moved me upstairs because they're reconfiguring the Gershwin Theater where Wicked's playing. So they just moved me upstairs uh, to, a, to a new dressing room, which is very nice. Um, but uh, yeah, no throne. I have a chair with some uh, duct tape holding it together. <laughs> and um, I just got a little TV to watch a little football, so. The magical world of Broadway. Of Broadway. Yeah, th when in thinking about Wicked and, and the sort of uh, cult that, yeah. fo uh, that is following along with Wicked, all the productions, waiting for a movie version, uh, cast albums, etc. Do you experience any of that fan frenzy when you come in or out of the theater? I do. I mean, every night there's people there waiting for autographs and everything. Of course, the witches and Fiero, the young male uh, lead, you know, people go crazy for them. They get fan art. They get letters, letters upon letters upon letters. The wizard is like, oh, yeah, look, it's the wizard. <laughs> so <laughs> it's nice. But um, it is quite a phenomenon to be part of the show. I mean, I've never, I've, I've toured with it twice. I've been on Broadway with it twice. There's currently nine worldwide productions. Wow. And uh, it, it's something to see. And people come again and again and again. Uh, You're like McDonald's of the theater. <laughs> exactly. On exactly. every corner, there's yeah. Wicked. Somewhere there's going to be a production of Wicked. You're not going to have to drive more than a couple hours, probably. But now, speaking of Halloween, that marks an anniversary of Halloween, doesn't it? They asked me when I, I just finished the uh, first national tour about four months ago. And on the very last day, they asked me if I wanted to be the 10th anniversary wizard. So I was very honored. It's a big deal. And it's, it's the night before Halloween is when it opened on Broadway in 2003. So we have our 10th anniversary coming up, and uh, it's very exciting. Will there be a cast album, do you think? I don't know. They haven't talked to us about it yet, so I'm I not sure. I think you should do a cast I album. I would love to be part of a cast album. Had The Wizard of Oz been on your radar, uh, besides the obvious that you know every year we watched it on TV, was the, were you a, a particular Wizard of Oz nut at any point in your life, where a lot of friends of Dorothy have been known to be uh, nuts? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, My first Halloween costume was the Wicked Witch <laughs> of the West. My daughter was actually uh, Dorothy at, uh, in, during for Halloween when she was like six. It was an omen. But, but I did, I was one of the, we were one of those families that watched it every year, because it was only on, you know, in those days, it was only on once a year, and we absolutely watched it. And the monkeys horrified me then, terrified me then, they still terrify me. Um, so, uh, yes, I was always aware of it. And when Wicked, the musical, came about, my daughter, who was nine at the time, turned me on to it. She got the cast album, and her and her friends started playing the characters in the backyard all summer long, to the point where they were doing the entire cast album, and sometimes two shows a day, and of course the parents had to sit and watch the show. Uh, and So that's how I became familiar with the show. And then when the first national tour came through, because I live in Los Angeles, uh, we went to see it right away, and a couple of years later I auditioned, and then my daughter was thrilled that her father was the wizard, mainly th so that he could introduce her to the <laughs> other people in the cast. Uh, she's hasn't she's not, has she got like done any dating yet? Is she uh, age appropriate you to know, date? You uh, know, well, she now she's eighteen. She just started college. She uh -huh. started uh, Syracuse University. She could date so. a Fiero, but don't let her date the monkeys. <laughs> exactly. Fair. To exactly. Say? At this point, I'd like her to stay away from Fieros too. <laughs> and monkey monkeys. <laughs> just and go Fiero. to class, and you know. Now, while we're still on the subject of Wicked, because there's a lot of other things to talk to you about, this, uh, you basically, this is contraband and banned from the Broadway production of yes. Wicked. What, uh, they what allowed me to bring one little prop. This is the Green Elixir. <laughs> it's a very interesting bottle that they have specially made. And uh, this sort of sets the whole ball rolling. 
the, the liquid in this bottle, which is actually mouthwash and a glow stick. So it, it, it doesn't just look like scope, it actually it is It actually scope. is scope. Okay. In case this ever opens <laughs> on stage, uh, we won't get, uh, we'll just have clean breath. But uh, this sort of s makes the Wicked Witch of the West green and sort of uh, launches the whole right. story. So uh, I wish we had dry great. ice here going. Yeah, but, exactly. Know, maybe well, we can add that in post. I've had enough of the dry ice. <laughs> is, it, a, is it hard? Is it rig I mean, is this a tough job or is it an easy gig? You come on, you go. I mean, do you sort of go on automatic pilot? How do you do? How's well, it work? you can't do that. If you go on automatic pilot, then it just can become bo boring. So. Um, uh, what, uh, what I've done uh, sort of as an actor is always try to give my focus to the alphabet because it's her story, uh, you know, for three hours. And I sort of pop in and out and get her hopes up and then dash her hopes and then get her hopes up and dash her hopes. So I always have to make sure I'm there for her. It is, I always say it's good to be the wizard because everyone in the Gershwin Theater works harder than I do. I mean, you know, I, I'm only on stage 25 minutes or so for the show. Um, but it has its own challenges too, sure. of, uh, you know, concentration, and I have to sing a couple songs, and there's a little dancing. So there's work involved. But you know, you see these young people just singing eight, nine, ten songs a, a night, eight shows a week. It's really impressive to see. And the dancers, they're dancing on a rake, they're picking people up, and then I just come in and uh, have my few. Well, moments, it's so. about time you were recognized <laughs> for being the star that I always knew you were. This is my green bottle. Of, this is my father's cologne, Royal Lime from oh. Bermuda. Do you know there's a connection between w Wiz The Wizard of Oz and Bermuda? L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, apparently wrote most of it while staying in Bermuda. Really? Uh, it's so you can smell good. I and have think of, no and idea. Now, you do know the origin of Elphaba's yes, name. Yes, I Tell do. us where the, that comes from. From L. Frank Baum. L. L. Ba ba. Very good. It's very clever. That's one of the things. There's so many, so many great clever moments in the show that either tie back to the stories or tie back to the movie. Uh, you know, that's what one of the things people love about and it. And people should be aware that if you're a huge Wizard of Oz fan and you're worried that this is somehow going to destroy or, or mar your love for all things wizardly, it certainly doesn't yeah. at all. It's very reverential. Well, we also now, we now have kids coming to the show who haven't seen the movie. Crazy. And so their entrance into Oz is through Wicked. And their parents say they go back and watch the movie, and now they look at the movie differently, it's, which is wild, because it's such a, an iconic movie for us, and for anyone, say, over 20, they've seen it hundreds of times. So uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, but it, it absolutely, uh, they're separate pieces, but the, you know, some of the, the cross-references are really what's a lot of fun about it. You're thinking to yourself, why does Tom look familiar to me? I, I haven't seen him in Wicked, but you've seen him on eight thousand million <laughs> other things uh, and I saw him first I, I saw him first I saw him first <laughs> Tom and I were college uh, colleagues we, I, I wouldn't we weren't friends in college he was an upperclassman uh, I, I you know had much older to do one of these but I remember you first playing Macbeth that's right that was our senior Shakespeare play I came to Hofstra University and you were playing Macbeth so to me as a young acting student that was like oh my gosh um, crazy but you weren't the original casting choice for That's me. right. I had been cast as Banquo and Brian Dennehy, the great Brian Dennehy. Brian Dennehy. His daughter Elizabeth was, I think, a junior at the time, and he had agreed to play uh, Macbeth. So we were all thrilled because he, he had come to other shows and is a terrific guy and a uh, fantastic actor. But there was something, I can't remember the specifics, but something with this, I think the SAG strike ended, so he had to go back to work. And with about 10 days to go, he had to drop out. And I got the part, and on very, very quick notice, which and, and uh, it was sort of a great, great learning experience. You were way. a very memorable Macbeth. It seems to me, though, you left college after graduating, mm -hmm. and I think you went, what is that crappy little drama school you <laughs> went to? <laughs> yes, but it took a few years. I, I waited tables, and I... Yale, yeah, Yale, Yale drama school. Yeah, yeah I, I waited tables, and I got my equity card doing this show, and I couldn't get an agent, and I did a little bit of that show. And a, at my third try getting into Yale, I, I got in. And then really, really, that that training there really uh, made a huge difference. And I, s ever since graduating, I've been very fortunate to just be a working actor. Yeah, you have never stopped working. And it, and it was one of those things, because we lost touch for many years there, as, as happens yeah. in grown-up land. 
and I'm like, wait a minute, that guy looks familiar. And I think it was Frasier, where you played right. Kenny, where I first made the connection. I mean, you were constant. I mean, you have guest starred on everything. Right. You've had series that have come and gone. Right. But Frasier was the one that seemed to uh, make you a recognizable face. Tell right. me, the, you know, in a nutshell, the Frasier experience. Well, what, what's amazing about my Frasier experience is my character was hired for one episode. And I was thrilled. I was like, I'm going to get to work with these great actors. It was the season finale of, I think, season five. And they had won, up to that point, five Emmys in a row for the best series. So I had been dying to get an episode of that show. I couldn't even get an audition, you know, because they don't call a lot of people in. And finally, I got a call from the casting director. I think we have a part for you. And it was one scene where I come in and I fire Frazier. And that was it. And it was very fun. I was like a nice guy, but I still had to fire him. So after the table reading, it was the best half hour of television I'd ever done. <laughs> and after the table reading, Kelsey Grammer reached over to me and said, don't worry, we'll fix it. I was like, fix it. This is the best thing I've ever read. And the next day, I came in, and there was a whole new script. And now, instead of one scene, I had three scenes. Wow. Oh, and now, is... instead of me firing him, I fire him early, and then I feel bad, and then I rehire him, and then they fire everybody. So the cliffhanger of the series was everyone at the radio station has now uh. been fired. So uh, it was great and fun, and thank you very much. And I went away for the summer. I came to New York to do the musical Chicago. And I got a phone call saying, oh, they'd like you to be in the first episode of the next season. I was like, sure. You know, Chicago was like, yeah, go ahead. Because um, there's going to be a picnic with all the fired people. And then during the season, Frazier got rehired. And they said, we'd like you to stay on as the station manager. So it became like three episodes this year and then seven episodes the next year and ten episodes the next year. And then finally I got a contract. And it was like the job of a lifetime. I mean, the, the, every time you got a script, you just couldn't believe how great it was. They were very kind to me. All I can think is now when you say this and Kelsey's saying to you, don't worry about it, the night the poor writers must have had. They were probably working <laughs> through the night. Oh, we got to rewrite this But this script. is what they do. I it's mean, amazing. of course, Frasier and, and the, other, the other series I did a lot of work on was Raymond. And everybody loves everybody Raymond. loves Raymond, and of course, quite often those scripts would be very close to being good. I mean, to being filmable the moment you got there. Right. But they would spend the week, you know, they do a run through every day, and this joke wouldn't work, so they, there would be something new. But very rarely would there be a sort of page one rewrite. But these guys could do it. They the, really um, could. Uh, the nice connection about everybody loves Raymond is our mutual friend, who sort of brought us back together again. Phil Rosenthal, who co-created and executive produced Raymond, right. your college classmate, yeah. his wife, Monica Haran, who played Amy uh, for all those seasons on Raymond, my classmate. So we were, um, you know, w the pairs of twos going yeah. together, uh, and they reconnected us. And it would be easy for someone on the outside to say, oh, nepotism. These people, they all went to college together, and he's hiring his wife to do this. Monica's arguably the funniest person yeah. on the planet, like Carol Burnett Absol kind of funny. Yeah, absolutely. Really, truly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so how does that work? And, and I understand that, Phil, that you sort of, you were able to do Raymond while still doing other things. Right. Where, and I sort of defend nepotism, because why wouldn't you want to work with people you know yeah. and trust? Tell me about the relationships. Well, w Phil and I have been friends since day one at Hofstra, and we lived together in the city and we did summer stock together and we always kept in touch even when I moved to he moved to Los Angeles first but we were always just best of friends um, but no one's gonna hire you if you're not good enough and certainly no one's gonna hire you if you're a pain in the neck so but we would we'd work together so often that he said with this show gets picked up Ray's gonna need some friends and I'd like you to be one of them so I was like oh great so the first season I did three or four episodes and and then you know, I've done plays back in New York, I've been back and forth, but when I was in town, they would use me. Nice. And what would happen, of course, is I wasn't on every episode of Frasier either, is that I'd sit home doing nothing for two months, and then I'd get a call saying, they both want you next week. And it happened again, and it was almost a joke. But Frasier I had a contract with, but Frasier was always like, we'll make it work. You know, Raymond was willing to give up a little time. I made two different networks. So two different just, networks. That's a testament to your well, appeal. Well, they were they they knew they weren't hiring me every week on Frasier, so they were happy that I had other work. They respected Phil and Raymond, so they uh, you know one would film on Tuesday, one would film on Friday, so it was doable. But there were a couple weeks in my career where episodes I had been in were like it, both in the top five. 
Like, you know, crazy. It, it, crazy. And I knew, even as I was running across the valley trying to get to one set from the other set, I was like, it's not going to get better than this. This is as good as it can get. It's good it's to be the wizard. It's good to be Tom again. <laughs> exactly. Those were great years. I did, I did six years on Frasier and sort of bits of all the eight or nine years on Raymond. And uh, it, it was just a joy. And people still call me Kenny on the street or they'll call me uh, Bernie from my character on, on Raymond. And, and you know, the, the shows still run here and people love it. And it's still hilarious. I mean, you yeah. can't, you watch an episode of Frasier or Raymond and you still laugh out loud. They and hold Time up. hasn't ta at all. tarnished it at yeah, all. They're classic. classic and for shows. Raymond fans, look out when, uh, when Ray Romano's wearing his Hofstra right. sweatshirt. It's right. like they made the character go to our alma mater. That's which right. Is really cool. And I think there's actually a softball team, the Wo Hop softball team, which was our favorite uh, restaurant down in Chinatown. Oh. And so when they, they needed a sponsor for their team and Phil made it Wo Hop. I was like, that's not very politically correct. No, we would go from Chinatown, uh, we would go from Washington Heights where we lived to Chinatown, sometimes at three in the morning, just because we needed some wool hop. And in New York, you can do that. Yeah, that's exactly right. We took advantage when we were in our but early But speaking 20s. of not politically incorrect, our mascot in college was the Flying Dutchman. Yes. And they did away with that because they thought, it, I don't know, if it was, what Dutch people were insulted by that, Bob. but they, they got rid of the Flying Dutchman. Bob Spiato used to wear the, the oh, like the, you right. know, he was like the musketeer right. at that's their football games, and now they're the Lions. How boring. I didn't even that. know that. I didn't even know that. Time has marched on and <laughs> left us behind. Um, all right, we, we have things to talk about. We're going to talk about your other work. Macbeth on the campus of Hofstra University to a Tony Award nomination for Labette. Mm -hmm. That was another accidental It was. I was thing. hired as a, a, it was a play by David Herson, written in rhyming couplets, but a new play. And this was in 1990. And it was my Broadway debut, but I was in the ensemble, but hired to be the understudy for the principal. And the very first night in Boston, the principal was not feeling well, so mm -hmm. we canceled that show, and I did sort of a rehearsal. And the next morning, he still wasn't feeling well, and they said, uh, we're going to open tonight with Tom. And then the lead <laughs> actor did go on the next night and was fired, and I got oh, the part. Oh, man. So we ran, had a great run in Sucks Boston. To be him. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was a, a magnificent play, and we came to New York, and, and we only lasted five weeks. The New York Times didn't like the play, although a lot of people did. But months later, we got five Tony nominations and six Drama Desk nominations, and I won an Out of Critics Award, and the playwright won an Out of Critics Award. So the people in the theater world loved, loved, loved that play, and, and many, many people came. Tell the story about... Uh, what Sondheim said to oh, you. Oh, yeah, when Sondheim, you had your Sondheim who saw that he saw that play and gave me a thumbs up. And of course, I just melted. I just, it was just amazing to me. Jerome Robbins came to that play. Catherine Hepburn came to the play. Paul Newman came. It was, it was incredible. But years and years later, I, I did a workshop for Stephen Sondheim uh, on 43rd Street. And we came downstairs one day, and I looked across the street in my very first apartment on 43rd <laughs> Street, which at that time was a horrible, horrible place to live. I lived there for a summer. There was a porno light flashing every night. It was like <laughs> out of a movie. But I, I was standing there talking to Mr. Sondheim, and I said, you know, I lived when I first moved to New York in 1981 in that window. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, sometimes it takes a lifetime to cross the street. And I was like, you got to put that in a musical. It That's a good be. line. But uh, it was amazing to be working with him and to look at, you know, where I started from. And now, I mean, then you, you, your life goes to California and you've made a slew of movies. Yes. Uh, which is really interesting. You ended up working with a friend of mine. I mean, sent big movies, small movies. I mean, are you, you're just like a, what's the, a journeyman. Yes. You, you, you will take the work. Yeah. A, ca a true character is. actor that is, is ready, you know, at a moment's notice to do whatever you need. I mean, I've loved doing television, so I've, I've sort of kept myself in L.A. for a lot of years. And I also love the theater. But the movies have come along and I've had, like you said, big parts and small parts but I've worked with you know, James Brooks and Clint Eastwood and, and like some really world-class directors. I just had a flash to a name I haven't thought of in 20 years, Carl Morris. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> he was yeah. a dance teacher at Hofstra. Yeah. like, if only you just kept up with your dancing, Tom, you'd be a triple <laughs> you threat now. Poor right. Carl Morris. Oh, yeah. I, 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 he can't still be with us. No, he's rest not. His he's soul. not, yeah. Um, just rattle off some of your movie credits. Well, uh, I think people will go, oh, my God, he's in that movie. Well, my first movie was Sleepless in Seattle. And I, oh, I was in movie. As Good As It Gets. I was in Last of the Mohicans. I was in Bad Santa. Heavyweights was sort of my big lead cult part, following. which became such a cult hit. Um, uh, 
Bean. I did the movie Bean, the <laughs> Rowan Atkinson movie. So I've done about 20 movies, I think. But with the pace of TV and theater, I would think it must be frustrating for you to do a movie because there's so much sitting around. There is, yeah. and, and, and I do like to film Boy. a lot of pages a day when I can, you know, uh, in television. I like the pace of television. So I finally ditched the BlackBerry and got an iPhone. Congratulations. It has a timer on it, which is a lot of fun. So I'm going to play a little game with you. Mm. You said you grew up watching The Wizard of Oz like the rest of us, that you uh -huh. let your family watch it as an annual event. Now right. you're the wizard in Wicked. Uh -oh. So I've just got, I just want to see. Uh -huh. People of our generation are pretty good with Wizard of Oz trivia. So I'm going to see how many Wizard of Oz trivia questions you can answer oh. in a minute. You ready? Yes. All right. Who was the original casting choice to play Dorothy? Shirley Temple. What did Miss Gulch put Toto in? A basket. Uncle Henry was married to? Auntie M. What did the Tin Man need in order to speak? Oil. Who played the Cowardly Lion? Bert Lahr. What did the Scarecrow want from the Wizard? A brain. The magician Dorothy visited on the roadside was named Professor don't know. It's your character. Marvel? Yes, Marvel. <laughs> Her house landed on the Wicked Witch of the East. What color was Glinda's dress in the movie? Yellow? Oh, first no. one wrong. Pink. In real life, Glinda portrayer Billy Burke was married to whom? No idea. The great Flo Zigfield. Oh. Who did not work for the Wicked Witch? The Winkies, the Winged Monkeys, or the Wiggles? The Wiggles. Correct. How did the Wicked Witch try to, try to off the Scarecrow? By burning him. That's right. What? So I did pretty good. Very good. I think you got one, you got one wrong. That was it. Glinda's dress. Glinda, Glinda's, Glinda's dress. dress. Was pink. And of course, and that's part pink. of the show, too. There you go. Well, see, now you've got your homework done, and I've proven my iPhone timer works. <laughs> <laughs> Tom McGowan, I hate to, you have a matinee to go to. I do. We can't. We could hang out all day, but we'll it's just. It's great to see you. Now, while you're in New York City, you'll spend more time at Nelson. Yes, I would love to. Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you.